I hope you're well. Uh, today we are going back to the presentation of Denise Scott Brown in Other Eyes, Portraits of an Architect by Frida Gran. Here she was in conversation with Gabriele Neri. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. How did this story begin? It started uh, four years ago, we can say. I was in Philadelphia in 2019 and I had received a, an appointment to uh, make, do an interview with Denise Scott Brown. So I was standing here in front of this uh, wonderful um, uh, Art Nouveau uh, villa and uh, Denise Scott Brown has lived here for 50 years together with Robert Venturi, who passed away in 2018. But they really spent uh, most of their life together here. And um, I had previously interviewed her on the phone, but meeting her in person was really something very special. And also to see the environment where they have lived. Um, you've been there too, right? It's a very special atmosphere uh, to, to, to see their, their work, to see um, the, the mock-up chairs for Knoll, to see the, the, the staples of books everywhere, the furniture, the, the Batman pattern on the cushions. The Guy Olinti lamp. Yeah, yeah, exactly, of course. Um, the, the wallpaper they designed with a, with a floral motif. And uh, Alto the dog. And Alto the dog, yeah, who is hiding somewhere here, <laughs> but he is also uh, very, he was very present too. He, he is always up for some, some, some cuddles, a <laughs> very nice dog. So it's this mix of the ordinary, which is kind of elevated into art. So, so the, the home is really kind of a manifestation of their uh, philosophy, of their, their, their uh, ideology. And here behind us again is a pa painting by Robert Jinder of a Spanish revival house with a gilded sky like an orthodox icon. So meeting Denise, apart from the home, meeting Denise uh, as, as a person, made a very strong impression on me. Uh, I was really impressed by her charisma and, and her intellect, her warmth, her generosity, and the stories she told from her life. And most of them were completely new to me. And this was a, 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 an amazing experience because I, I had really read quite a lot about her and on her, of her texts and so on. But, but still, she, she, these two hours, she, she just, continuously surprised me. And I realized how little is known about her. And um, time and again, doors kept really opening to unexpected fields. And, and time and again, the discrimination which she has faced throughout her career came up. And it was really staggering to imagine what this brilliant person has been going through for, for decades, really. And I felt strongly that I really needed to immerse myself in her universe uh, to really get to know her, to, to be able to do her justice. A little later, after my return to Switzerland, I met Elisabeth Bloom, who is one of the editors of the Bauwelt Fundamenta series, which has been published uh, since 1963. So uh, this is uh, number 176, so there are quite a few uh, books in this series. And among the books they have published uh, is a German translation of um, Learning from Las Vegas, so Lernen von, von Las Vegas. And um, the idea of this series was to make architecture theory available to larger audience. So they started out in the 60s, they were kind of small, they were kind of cheap uh, and so on. And, and in German, <laughs> although this book and in recent years, they have started to make books in English uh, to reach uh, an even larger audience. And uh, Elizabeth spoke to me about her idea to publish a book, uh, to, to publish an anthology on Denise Scott Brown. And I was immediately interested, also because this recent experience uh, I'd had in Philadelphia and um, I, I said, okay, I would like to do that. And, and she said, oh, but your, your dissertation, Frida, is a little bit different. It, it is on Swiss architecture. Could you do this? Could you do an anthology on her? And I said, of course. <laughs> so, um, so I developed a, a concept with a title and with 10 authors, which I, I would be interested in, and uh, an idea of, of the content and so on. 
and send it to her. And 30 minutes after I had sent that email, she replied, okay, let's do this. So, so that was really a, a wonderful experience. Um, she was very um, happy and, 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 and enthusiastic uh, about the, the concept from the beginning. So I began sending out invitations to, to authors to, to write essays. Um, the title, uh, my, the first title I came up with was different. It was Reading the City. But I, I spoke with Denise about this and she, she said that her work is so much more, uh, it, it, it includes so many more aspects than just reading the city. So I had to think again. <laughs> and I, I, I came, came up with the current title. It is a nod to, to Le Corbusier. Um, Denise Scott Brown is, is uh, often uh, um, talking about the eyes that doesn't see uh, and, and so on, that don't see. And uh, Stanislav Moss and Martino Stierle are also playing on this in their title uh, of, of their anthology, which came out two years ago. So we, we're kind of moving in this uh, field <laughs> of, of, of seeing, of ways of seeing, of uh, eyes that are seeing in different ways um, and so on. It's, it's also a way of um, expressing subjectivity. So, so this is, this, these are some ways to look at Denise and it's, it's not the final version, it's not the final biography, um, it's maybe not the complete story, so it's an invitation to engage with this um, topic um, further, really. And, and the same also uh, with the, the plural portraits of an architect. It is not one portrait, but, but many portraits. And one of the most striking portraits is that on the cover. And it was taken in 1978 by the American photographer Lynn Gilbert during work on her um, book, Particular Passions, Talks with Women Who Have Shaped Our Times. And there's a wonderful uh, art, uh, chapter on Denise Scott Brown also in this book. So it was really a discovery to, to find these photographs of Denise Scott Brown in 78 uh, where she looks so confident and, and is really in a very interesting um, time in her career and so on. So, and, and this document also, this, this book by, by Lynn Gilbert is also an amazing account of women who pioneered in male-dominated uh, field, uh, fields back then. So um, it's, it's very nice to connect, uh, connect uh, these, uh, these things. So as for the content, uh, I invited scholars who had previously uh, published on Robert Venturi and The Office. They led together. And to my surprise, almost everyone said yes. So uh, after a couple of weeks uh, of, of being a bit nervous, <laughs> um, it, it was really amazing. So, so the, the, the positive replies really started to, to fill my inbox. 14 of the 25 texts are newly written historical essays that build on and critically uh, assess Denise's production of own writings. So, and we see some of them here, and they are all great. I can really recommend them. Uh, some, some of it she, she published with Venturi. Um, so, so we had this as, as, as one source, of course, but many of the authors also went to the archive in Philadelphia, which is the main archive, uh, holding um, unpublished, a lot of unpublished archival sources uh, on Denise Scott Brown life and work. So, so we have the Venturi Scott Brown collection here at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I went there myself and uh, found pages like this um, handwritten manuscripts of a lecture Denise Cook Brown gave in 1978. So um, the, the, the same year again. And um, I really spent some time deciphering her handwriting, uh, trying to find out what, what happened in this lecture, what, what, what was it about. Um, and I had the opportunity to meet with her and ask her directly if uh, what I had thought I, I read, <laughs> if it was really, 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 really correct. So, um, so that's been really amazing to have her as a first-hand source 
Um, so she's been helping not just me, but also other, uh, many others of, of, the, of, the, of the authors. And it's really been invaluable. So these historical essays are interspersed with recollections by friends and colleagues of Denise to balance history and theory with personal memories. And I will give you a very brief overview of the chapters, which are all really remarkable in their own ways. So we have three parts, learning, teaching, and designing. And we start each uh, part with a quote. I grew up surrounded by my mother's Africa of the mind. Stories of her beloved wilderness imbued me with my own love for the veld and a preference for occupying the outskirts, the edge of things. So Denise Scott Brown was born as Denise Lakowski in Kana, in what is today Zambia, in 1931. And in the, the first chapter, um, Craig Lee explores how Denise's early life in Africa, um, these are her own photos, influenced her later view of the everyday American urban landscape and Las Vegas, as we see here. The next chapter is written by Robin Middleton, one of Denise's oldest friends. They met already in, in Johannesburg, where Denise um, began to study architecture in 1949. And he gives us insight into their joint work on the exhibition Man Made Johannesburg in 1951. And here we see Robin Middleton and Denise Scott Brown in Philadelphia in 2016, as she uh, received the American Institute of Architects gold medal. Uh, so this was a really important uh, occasion. So they are still very, very good friends. Uh, the next chapter is by Andrew Leach, the Australian scholar. Denise um, Scott Brown continued her studies at the Architectural Association in London in 1952, where she encountered the British reception of mannerism and how this influenced Denise's thinking is the subject of Andrew Leach's chapter. And in London, she also encountered uh, Alison Peter Smithson, uh, who are, were also interested in mannerism. So, so this all, all comes together in, in this chapter. Um, the next chapter is by Denise Costanzo, and, and she's speaking about another conceptual anchor, so not mannerism, but functionalism. So she is diving into this topic, and her focus is on the Siam Summer School in Venice in 56, which Denise attended with her first husband, Robert Scott Brown, who we sit he see here, uh, with Denise in Venice in 56. And uh, after Venice, they went to Rome together. And uh, Carolina Vaccaro describes this uh, time in their, in their life, uh, traveling in Italy. And they were working in her father's office, so in Giuseppe Vaccaro's office in Rome. And this was also an important time. After this, in 58, they moved to Philadelphia and started studying at the University of Pennsylvania, where um, people like Herbert Gans uh, would become very important. He was an urban sociologist, and he was um, the one who encouraged Denise Scott Brown to uh, go to uh, Las Vegas, uh, actually, and, and, and study that. So study Los Angeles, study Las Vegas, and really find out what this is all about. So he became very important, as Mariana Charitoni Du writes, so we come to the second part of the, uh, of the book, uh, start, starting with this quote. In 1965, after 10 years of urbanism, my folk were automobile cities of the American Southwest, social change, multiculturalism, action, everyday architecture, messy vitality, iconography, and pop art. So this is a summary of her uh, interests in the 60s. And here are the, the chapters. So it focuses on her teaching in the 60s. And during this time, she developed methods and theoretical concepts. She began teaching at the University of Pennsylvania directly after graduating in 1960. 
And uh, this was just after the tragic death of her first husband, Robert Scott Brown, in a car accident. And she dealt with her grief by devoting herself to, to studies and, and then also to teaching. So, and this is the topic uh, of Lee Ann Custer's chapter, which is really wonderful. And it builds on unpublished sources, really. So she really dived into the archive. And she explores how the teaching really served as a testing ground for ideas about the street, for instance, as we see here on this image. So about the street as a design element in itself and about the communicative power of the city. So ideas that would form the basis of her later studies of Las Vegas. So we see how, how this connects again. Uh, and, and here she develops an interdisciplinary teaching method based on urban analysis, focusing on hidden patterns and forces. And one of her first students, uh, James Yellin, describes how she and another teacher, Paul David Duff, influenced each other. And he introduced the concept advocacy planning. So this is also a very interesting and important chapter. An advocacy planner, a planning was a, a way to support underprivileged groups in society. So Scott Brown met Venturi at a faculty meeting in 1960. They became friends and started to collaborate on their respective courses. And Venturi worked on his book, Complexity and Contradiction Architecture, at this time. Um, and Scott Brown worked at her own manuscript, actually, at, at this point. But it didn't receive financial um, support, um, uh, as, as Venturi did. Venturi did, so it wasn't published. But it, history could have taken another direction, maybe, if, if her uh, book manuscript had been uh, uh, published at, at this point. It was called Determinant of Urban Form. After her time at Penn, Scott Brown was invited to teach in California, first in, in Berkeley, then at UCLA in Los Angeles. And in her chapter, uh, Sylvia Levin um, describes how Scott Brown's central research tool of town watching uh, was conducted on the freeway, as we see here, but also from the helicopter, um, for instance. So uh, there is this popular conception that, that um, Denise Scott Brown's ideas are very much connected to, to, to the car and automobilism. That's true, but it's not everything. So there are many other modes of transportation that, are, that play a role in her work. And while in Los Angeles, Scott Brown visited Las Vegas four times and decided to teach a studio on the city. And on one of these trips in 66, she invited Robert Venturi to join her. And they married one year later uh, in Santa Monica and returned to Philadelphia together. Although Denise Scott Brown had actually obtained tenure at UCLA at this point, uh, but she returned to Philadelphia instead and joined the firm of Venturi and Rauch and became a partner in 69. In 68, the couple conducted their first design and research studio together, as I think many of you know, at Yale School of Architecture. And the results were published in Learning from Las Vegas in 72, uh, with the assistant Stephen Eisenhower. And the book became very famous, <laughs> and it would um, really become one of the most influential texts on architecture theory of the 21st century. And, and uh, it, it became famous for these very interdisciplinary methods which uh, Denise Scott Brown had developed during her teaching uh, in Philadelphia and in, in Los Angeles. This is really one of the, the most important findings of, of the book, I would say, to, to really see how interconnected um, this, this was. And the Las Vegas study was really done, or, or a big part of it, to, to understand the consequences of automobilism. And it was rapidly changing cities at this point in, in time, changing the urban landscape and the city spread in urban sprawl of, of, of billboards, driving restaurants and motels and so on. We know this. And at the same time, um, the neglected city centers were often subject to uh, urban renewal, uh, which displaced the poor population. So this we can, we can see in, in many, uh, many cities, and it was also the case in Philadelphia. And it, it led to an increasing demand for participation 
in the planning process. So here is where the advocacy planning uh, becomes uh, really um, urgent again. And one of the first projects of Denise was for South Street. So it was really one of these neglected areas in central Philadelphia, and it was threatened by the construction of a highway. And um, Denise was asked to make a study uh, proposal to save this uh, area and to support the black residents and business owners uh, to, to, to do this. And uh, Sarah Moses in her chapter describes how, how this was done by, by Denise Gofraun and how she, for instance, used photography as a method to document and really show the, the value of this uh, part of the city. So this work as an advocacy planner went on in parallel with the Las Vegas study. So we have a wish to understand the complexity of everyday life here. And, and this is really uh, the case in both projects. The second part ends with this uh, chapter by Catherine Smith, where we also see the connection between the everyday urban environment and pop art, um, actually. So this is another aspect of this. We come to the third part, which begins, ultimately, then, it was not about jumping from architecture to planning, but about rethinking what it was to be an architect, and that choosing amelioration over evolution would itself be revolutionary in architecture. So this summarizes uh, her ideology very well. And here are the chapters. And we see a more practical side of Denise's work here as an architect, urban planner and designer. And we also see the, the reception um, of, of, um, by other people. It begins with recollections by Ines Lamunier, the Geneva architect, who met uh, Rob Venturi and Denise Brown the first time in one of these houses by IMP in 1970, as she visited Philadelphia, she was only 16 years old, and she became the, the dean of EPFL in Lausanne uh, later on in her life. But this was a very important uh, moment. Um, and we come to my own chapter, and this links back to, to Geneva, actually, uh, a city which became very important for Denise Scott Brown uh, because her parents moved there in 1960. So they visited Switzerland, her and Venturi, uh, she and Venturi visited Switzerland every year, uh, actually. And they were invited in 78 to give lectures at the 50th anniversary of SIAM, the Congresses for Modern Architecture. And this is a bit surprising, perhaps, as they were such strong um, critics of SIAM. Um, but they were really the, the stars at this event. They were also uh, quite vocal about their, their critique. And this, this conference was, was held in La Sada, uh, outside of, of Geneva. What was interesting is that Denise showed her work on town planning and also on preservation, preserving small American towns. And she did many of these projects in the 70s. So not only on South Street in Philadelphia, but also here and in Thorpe in Galveston, in Texas, and in many other places. So this is really an important, important part. And uh, in her lecture, she argues for uh, little plans. So instead of the CM urban renewal, um, tabula rasa <laughs> uh, way of planning, she, she is really trying to understand what's already there and how it can be improved and how the social structure can be kept. And uh, this uh, really opened eyes of Mark Angelil, for instance, who would later teach at ETH for a long time. He was there at the, as a student in 78, and in an email he wrote this to me. I remember that a small group of students who were studying with Aldo van Eyck at ETH Zurich went to La Sara to specifically see and hear what Robert Venturi had to say. Venturi showed a lot of flower motifs that he was decoratively applying on facades and furniture, this was somehow disappointing to us. However, the big surprise was Denise Scott Brown, who talked about social issues and the role of politics in architecture, urban design and planning. And in hindsight, her lecture marked my further development, though I did not know at the time how influential she would turn out to be. So this is really incredible in a way, that, that this lecture by her really would shape his whole career in a way. We continue with some more flower motifs <laughs> in the chapter uh, where Christopher Long explains Denise's view on postmodernism and compares her critique of modernism with Josef Frank, the Austrian architect. Very interesting chapter. 
We have more flower motifs uh, in, the, the, in my interview with Jacques Herzog. And um, he wouldn't really accept um, the, the, the direct influence of learning from Las Vegas, or uh, in this case, uh, in the, the formal <laughs> um, uh, similarities perhaps uh, in, in his use uh, of, of ornament, but would rather talk about Lucy's Burkhardt, for instance, and, and other social ideas which were important at this time. But there is a connection there. And there is a connection in the chapter by Stanislas von Moos, where he sees an uh, important parallel between Denise Scott Brown's view of the city and that by Herzog and Demeron. So they, look, they both look at the city as something in movement, as something in, in a flow, something not uh, consistent but uh, always changing. So he describes this very beautifully in his essay and he also returns to Venice and compares the city shape of Venice with uh, some of their built projects, uh, the built projects by Ventura Scott Brown, such as the Sainsbury Wing. And um, he has this idea of um, these shapes and, and the city of Venice also as an organic, uh, organic form. And the, the idea of a city as something organic uh, returns in, in the chapter by Hilary Sample, where we look at the, the city as a nervous system. And she focuses on Denise Scott Brown's studio on health in Harvard in 1989. Aaron Vinegar, finally, uh, is one of, one of the last chapters. He asks how Denise's method of city analysis can be used. How can it be implemented in design projects? And we receive a response by Françoise Blanc in her uh, chapter, a project which she worked on uh, for a long time together with Denise Brown, the, the Parliament building in Toulouse. So this is the, the chapters where it work together in a very nice way here. So the provincial capital in Toulouse really functioned as a laboratory for implementing uh, Denise's uh, way of analysis. And uh, this is seen most clearly in the diagonal, uh, which uh, connects the old part of the city with a shopping center. And this was Denise's idea, so, so it had a very direct influence here. So we come to the epilogue, and it starts with a quote by Venturi, so he's also represented here. And last, you will notice during this loosely chronological description, I have used more and more the first person plural, that is we, meaning Denise and I. All my experience representing appreciation, support and learning from would have been less than half as rich without my partnership with my fellow artist Denise Scott Brown. There would be significantly less dimension within the scope and quality of the work this award is acknowledging today, including dimensions theoretical, philosophical and perceptive, especially social and urban, pertaining to the vernacular, to mass culture, from decorative to regional design, and in the quality of our design, where Denise's input, creative and critical, is crucial. And this is from his acceptance speech in 1991, as he received the Prisker Prize alone, <laughs> which was really uh, quite a, a big uh, scandal. But Denise actually suggested that we use this quote in the book. So uh, this means a lot for her that, that uh, he mentioned her in this way uh, in his speech. The epilogue contains a letter by Denise, uh, newly written, um, to one of the, the young scholars and architects who are inspired by her work today, Biliana, and a few notes to me as well. And it ends with a, a photo essay by Jeremy Tenenbaum, who is a very close friend and an assistant of Denise. And in this letter, she highlights how she developed ideas with Venturi and how they were really intertwined in a way. How one plus one can become more than two. And she also returns to Toulouse again. It's one of her favorite projects. And uh, she describes what's hap what happened since the, the Las Vegas studio. And she focuses on the campus uh, projects. She sent me some more photos from Toulouse, actually. So these are her own uh, photos of Toulouse that she always uses when she talks about the project. So here we can see where her focus lays on, on the context, for instance. And this is one of her photos of the building. So. Uh, 
again, it's really important to see where we are located in the city and not to idealize anything, but really see reality how it is. So this is uh, very telling. So this anthology is more than a homage. It aims to open up new perspective on Denise Capron and her thinking in ways that reflects her holistic approach and the broad range of her professional identities, as you have seen as an architect, planner, urban, urbanist, theorist, uh, writer, and educator. And she is known for celebrating the vitality of the contemporary city, uh, its richness, layers, and contrasts. And her genius uh, lies in her ability to channel transdisciplinary knowledge into new synthesis, combining innovative thinking with a passion and enthusiasm for countless subjects that really has enriched architecture's set of techniques. So she's a mediator among professions, cultures, and continents, making a mark on cultural discourse um, as few others have done, and really going beyond the fields of architecture and urbanism. But it's despite these accomplishments, her contributions have long remained unrecognized or been wrongly attributed. And as Mary McLeod writes beautifully in her preface, she has struggled to obtain status and recognition in a white male star-studded profession while being committed to helping other women do the same. This is my introduction to the book, and uh, thank you for, <laughs> for your attention. And I would like to, to open to, to a discussion, a conversation with you, yeah? And again, as I as end also to a conversation with, with the audience for questions and everything, you are very welcome to, to, to ask uh, also. But I, I've been thinking, as I said, I really liked, liked your review very much, and uh, I would be interesting to hear what Denise has meant to you as a teacher, scholar, and, and so on? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I'm no. to join you <laughs> here. It was a pleasure. Well, the first time I, I met her was uh, in Philadelphia, because mm -hmm. I was there in 2016 or 17, uh, more or less one year before uh, Robert Venturi passed away. Mm. Uh, I was there to study Louis Kahn, uh, Louis Kahn's archive, uh, and so I had the chance to get a tour of, of their uh, beautiful house, yeah. uh, and, and so, well, to, to get in touch with uh, Robert Venturi, who mm -hmm. was, uh, well, already quite, let's say, tired at that time, mm. uh, and so, well, he just showed up, but actually I had, together with my colleague Elisabetta Barizza, we were preparing a, an exhibition um, in Membrisio about Louis Kahn in Venice and yeah. so well uh, we wanted to ask something to Robert and to Denise as well about mm. uh, connections uh, Kahn, Venturi and, and this stuff but mm -hmm. uh, the surprising thing uh, I guess is that uh, after a, a brief uh, let's say introduction in, in their uh, living room with mm -hmm. uh, the alto, the dog, with uh, <laughs> a lot of ducks uh, everywhere, yeah. um, plastic ducks and uh, Gaulenti's lamp and all these, uh, uh, some uh, Michelangelo writings on yeah, the walls. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was a very, it's a really interesting, probably a study should be made uh, on uh, on the house. On the too. house. That's and true. It's like uh, Let's return uh, to layering that of. Uh, uh, of objects and furniture and styles and mm. so it's a very layered interior uh, yeah. but uh, the second point uh, she started well she proposed uh, to, to present uh, as uh, her work uh, mm. her ongoing work uh, about uh, the huge amount of pictures of photographs that she had been taking since uh, she was in South Africa yeah. and, and so uh, well, she started doing sort of private lecture mm -hmm. about her work, uh, right. um, showing uh, the draft of a book that mm. would be published in, in, in a few months or years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was mm. my v very first encounter with mm -hmm. uh, the complexity and the deepness of, of her work, uh, not only 
in the field, let's say, of architecture, not only in practicing architecture, but also in many other directions. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I got interested in many perspectives and angles that she mm. could uh, had had in her previous work. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I, I read immediately your, your book, and I think that it's a very good uh, work uh, from many angles. First of all, because uh, uh, you succeeded in uh, composing and directing such a, a multifaceted mosaic or patchwork of uh, contributors uh, and uh, threads that uh, well, you well explained, just explained uh, all the different uh, parts of the book from yeah. the teaching and the designing, mm -hmm. uh, but also learning. So yeah. the first part, for instance, the, the part uh, one, um, well, gives uh, a very, I would say not complete, but a very <laughs> vast uh, overview of crossing of culture that mm -hmm. she had during uh, the different stages of uh, her life. So I think that, well, being uh, somehow always uh, on the other side, because mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting how she describes her feelings uh, while uh, being, uh, uh, while staying and living in South Africa. Yeah. And so often feeling a complex uh, relationship between uh, her native, uh, mm. uh, her, the origin yeah. of her and uh, uh, all the other culture that he, she would discover in, mm. in the following years. Yes. So London, yeah. uh, of course, uh, Rome, mm. an interesting yeah. uh, experiences in, in, in Rome because, uh, well, one uh, probably couldn't expect such a change of environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mm -hmm. from, from South Africa to Johannesburg to London and then to Rome with Vaccaro designing yeah. the Ina Casa yeah. uh, houses uh, mm -hmm. in the 1950s. I think that, uh, again, uh, it's a process of uh, layering experiences that, that she would uh, bring to the United States, yeah. uh, both on the West and the East Coast, finally. Mm. And so this process of adding uh, is well uh, portrayed in this anthology of, uh, of essays. I think that's a, um, a huge work of, for, for composing and being the, the director of this, uh, <laughs> uh, this stuff. Yeah. And, and later mm. I have a couple of mm. questions for, for you. This is the first worth of, of the book, so mm -hmm. discovering Denise uh, and discovering many more uh, issues and many more perspectives. The mm -hmm. second and probably widest aim of, of the book uh, is uh, a question that uh, uh, one could uh, ask after reading, while reading this book, is how to portray an architect uh, nowadays. This yeah. book, uh, is, of course, it's different from uh, the average uh, monographic studies, the masters of mm -hmm. uh, uh, the 20th century. And it also opens uh, these, these uh, questions of how mm -hmm. to describe, how mm -hmm. to study, how to uh, make also a synthesis in this yeah. uh, play of uh, somehow reducing uh, the complexity of the work of uh, whoever architect uh, in, in a single, in this case, in a book or in a single tale, in a single story. And on the other hand, uh, probably at the opposite, uh, expanding, so mm. enlarging and widening, uh, so somehow blowing up uh, mm. uh, one single thread, one single story yeah. in uh, many more yeah. different uh, layers and, uh, and perspectives. For instance, a few years ago there was an exhibition at the CCA in Montreal that was The Other Architects uh, and was a very good exhibition and showing uh, all the different and again multifaceted uh, potentials mm -hmm. and, and options of being an architect doing different things. So mm -hmm. from activism, from, okay, of course, designing buildings, uh, mm -hmm. but also being a mediator, you mm -hmm. used this, uh, this yeah, term yeah, yeah. Uh, before. Um, and so, um, this, oh, this anthology and, of course, uh, the work of uh, and life and career of Denise Scott Brown show us uh, other architects uh, in, in this way. So, yeah. rediscovering, uh, yeah. we can rediscover some uh, perspectives that mm -hmm. are often are hidden 
under flag uh, or under mm -hmm. a more reductive uh, synthesis of uh, somehow the myth of yeah, yeah. Uh, the master yeah, builder exactly. yeah, yeah, or yeah. the mm -hmm. myth of the yeah. great uh, architect artist uh, who mm -hmm. has successful uh, career mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. it's like growing and growing yeah, and growing yeah. up to a certain exactly. kind of success yeah. Yeah. and so getting bigger and bigger mm -hmm. buildings and commissions uh, and yeah. so at the end of his career being or his or her career mm -hmm. more often his career mm -hmm. being uh, mm -hmm. celebrated uh, and so it's like a crescendo it's, yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah, exactly. something mm -hmm. growing up uh, and uh -huh. then reaching the acme of, of the discussion here right, right. the perspective is completely fragmented mm, yeah. in many more uh, mm. pieces mm, uh, and mm. uh, probably it yeah. we can learn from uh, denise scott brown but also yeah. from your book how the work of the architect mm. of an architect can be mm. much more interesting yes, uh, i would yes. say and also in terms yes, of yeah. uh, the representation it's also interesting in, in the way uh, her work is uh, represented in the book in terms mm. of iconography of course this yeah. is uh, not a coffee table yeah, book yeah, yeah. with uh, yeah, yeah. all, all the pictures images, that yeah, probably yeah. she she would also well, deserve sure. but yeah. uh, in this case uh, there is a complexity of uh, also in iconography yeah. so uh, mm. documents uh, Mm. pictures uh, mm. by herself or pictures mm. by somebody else uh, buildings mm. of course but mm. the, the designing uh, yeah. part and also the building that she contributed to are uh, not the main uh, mm. point of yeah. uh, of so, these of these <coughs> studies and yeah. of course uh, it mm. it uh, leaves many more uh, uh, yeah. know, room for investigation. Yes, yes, definitely. So, so we'll see. There, there might be a second edition uh, coming out, which would have more projects, I think, and uh, even more concrete work, I would say. But it's a very interesting question and something to really um, think about how to portray a person like this who is so diverse and uh, it was it was really amazing that in the, these first conversations I had like how how to pinpoint this uh, how to give such a book on, on Denise Scott Brown a title what kind of box can we put Denise Scott Brown in because she, she doesn't want to be put in any box or, or be categorized in any way so uh, it was really a struggle because as an historian and and uh, you know as an editor this is exactly at some point what you need to do. You, you can't say this is a book about everything <laughs> and uh, this, uh, this includes everything and I will talk about everything and I will invite everyone, <laughs> and, you know? And I think that is really the, the challenge here. And uh, it was about reduction and it was about coming to a close and about what one can do in a limited amount of time also. We had set ourselves, a, or I had set myself, a quite strict uh, time frame. Uh, so we wanted to publish the book for the anniversary of Learning from Las Vegas. That was quite helpful, actually. It really made it necessary to come down to something and, and to crystallize uh, something. And uh, these parts, I mean, especially the first two parts about her background and about her teaching felt extremely important to focus on because that is what leads up to learning from Las Vegas. And I think now, um, in the end, looking back and, and so on, this is probably one of the main messages <laughs> to show how it all began and, and to, to show how Denise's background influenced her later work. So, and, and this is really the reason why there is such a a uh, large uh, focus on, on the first uh, decades of her uh, formation and, and so on. So that was, that was a choice, um, that's true. Um, and I have a question, yeah, which, which yeah. is, uh, mm -hmm. how did she approach you at the very beginning yeah. of, of this idea, of the starting point of this book? How did she approach you? I mean, uh, how did she interpret it or uh, approach yeah. The uh -huh. idea of yeah. having uh, a lot, of people, a lot yeah. of people. Right. In, she in, was uh, a bit hesitant in the beginning um, uh, when she first learned about the project. And uh, uh, we talked on the phone and so on. We had many, many, many uh, phone conversations during these years. I um, read the, the list of contributors to her, and she was a bit critical at times. She said, Oh, this person might be a great scholar, but I don't think he has anything, any idea about my, <laughs> my work. <laughs> And, and then she suggested people who would have more of an idea, who would be closer to her, like Françoise Blanc, for instance, and James Yellen, 
who, who were really working very, very closely and, and really had a first-hand experience of, uh, uh, of, of her ideas. So, so this is also a way of dealing with it. I mean, um, there's this question about how to tackle a, 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 a task like this. Uh, there are many, many ways or many strategies I've been following. So, so there's different um, types of contributions. It's also an interesting thing or an important thing, I think, to have these recollections, people who are closer and then other people who are zooming out, who have these, who have never met her <laughs> even, and, and who, who have this uh, really view from, from this outside perspective, this really objective uh, view. And then there are some people who are in between, who, who have talked with Denise, who have long conversations and so on. So, so there's really this whole spectrum of voices in the end. I was impressed by these two lines uh, from letter to Biliana, yeah. notes to Frida. At the end of the book, so in the epilogue of the book is, Dear Biliana, I very much enjoyed our telephone conversation, etc. But as we talked, it became clear to me that what you and various other writers, mainly women, want mm. to know about me has not been written. Yeah. And so that was interesting because the, the letter is uh, February 2022. So yeah. actually it was at the end, not mm -hmm. at the beginning, but at the it end of, of this huge work. Yeah. So, uh, well, I was curious yeah. to, to hear also, so after the, the, the first encounter, mm -hmm. but how she reacted or how she mm -hmm. received this, uh, yeah. this, this book and, and yeah. also reading, because I had, right. I mm -hmm. had uh, for instance, in a, in a smaller way, this, ex this experience with mm. some uh, old architect. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> she knows. Who. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, after uh. after studying and writing uh, for mm. for years about about so, mm. uh, what is the, the reaction or the feedback mm. that right, you, right. you got from uh, yeah, exactly. that she yeah. got? No, thank you. Um, it, perhaps two comments. D this letter to Biliana, she um, sent to Biliana. But she copied me, hmm. so 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 that was really interesting. She wanted me to to read it, and and I did, <laughs> and and that that just exactly this this sentence that you that you point out was very important for me too because I, I said aha okay so this this is Denise telling her story and and telling a story which she hasn't uh, told before. So all right, uh, sure, <laughs> we of course I should I need to include this. So I asked her um, instantly really if we if we may include it. So, so it felt important to have this epilogue to, to hear from her also. Um, but really to, to kind of limit her, or the epilogue is from her, it's, it's her photographs and, and, and these, uh, these texts by her. But the rest of the book should really be from, by other, other people, uh, the, the view from, from the outside. It was, it was very exciting to find out what she thinks about the book. <laughs> and um, I sent it to her uh, in an early stage uh, after publication in October. Um, her eyes are not so good anymore. So this is really kind of a paradox. We talk so much about seeing and about eyes and views and so on. And her vision is not perfect. So she is not able to, to read the book but she likes it as an object. <laughs> and she was able to read the content with an iPad, so, so, so one of these, and zooming in on the text. And this, of course, took much longer. So she needed weeks um, doing this, but in the end, she read all of it. And she, she called me uh, in January and said, bravo, <laughs> it's, it's lovely, I, I, I really like it. So that was a big, big, big relief that, that she doesn't say, oh, they got it all wrong. <laughs> this is too reductive. This is a big, huge mistake and, and so on and so forth. So she really supports it. And, and she has been at all these events uh, virtually present and so on. And uh, it's really amazing to be able to give this to her now uh, after this career of, of struggle really what, what that she has had. Always being in the shadow of Venturi she has been asked to move out of pictures for future photo opportunities, for instance. Denise, we want to take a picture of the architects. Can you please uh, go to the, the wives, <laughs> to the other wives? And, and uh, oh, Denise, I wanted to invite your, your uh, husband to, for lunch, but it's only for, for the architects, it's not for the wives. So it's just things, things like this. It's, it's been throughout her, her career, really, so career. 
So um, this struggle and that she now late in life gets this recognition that she was able to experience it. Also the, the symposium we had at Yale with the, the 300 people attending online and, and uh, to really see these presentations of the, the, the authors, the contributors who had written on her and, and uh, to be able to experience that live, it's just uh, it's a wonderful. I found quite interesting that, well, both Mintuki and her yeah. never thought about doing a catalog with Dune. It has always been since Le Corbusier's main movement mm. that architects would think about documenting it in a book form their own work. Yeah, right, yeah. Which is not always good, especially nowadays, mm. because now it's a huge tendency young architects, mm -hmm. yeah. relatively young architects, yeah. you know, they're 45, 50, and they start doing their own mm. oeuvre. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's yeah. curious that they did so much, both from theory, mm. to teaching, to building, yeah. but they never thought about putting out there yeah. the whole what? Yeah, there are these two monograph monographs by Stanislas Moss, yes. though, yeah. Yes. But that was kind of through his lens, of course. Yes. They, they collaborated quite a lot on that, too. So it's kind of half the, the, the books are more or less uh, project descriptions by them and so on. So I guess that sort of counts, uh, I suppose. Yeah, but you know, the idea mm. of doing a catalog with an eight, like yeah. this number, you know, project. Right, yes, right, 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 right. No, no, that's, that's true. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no, but no, that's the, true. But the problem, I think, that yeah. it's not aligned. So, you, yeah. how to do it? I mean, in terms of uh, editorial uh, program yeah. or project, yeah. how mm. how can you condense or uh, organize the entire work of uh, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi Associate in a single series? Of, in this case, uh, I mean, mm. uh, it's entropy. So mm. it's it's yeah, more yeah. like uh, having uh, because yeah. of course, if you talk about some of the terms that you have in the book, the, uh, mm. the power of teaching or town watching mm. or joint creativity or social activism, mm -hmm. all these uh, perspectives, of course, how to make a synthesis of all mm. the social, all the activism that she made in Philadelphia. Yeah, These are right. not a project with a beginning and an end and a mm. picture. And so mm. this is another problem because, of course, when you have uh, the, car when the career of an architect is uh, just a series of projects mm. and maybe books uh, and maybe something else, uh, but okay, mm. it's uh, quite easily could be quite easily catalogued with, with some pictures. You have mm. a good photograph mm. and, and it's, it's fine. Instead here, maybe you don't have pictures, so you, mm. have, you don't have a project, you mm. don't have a, a, a real mm. outcome or you yeah. have an, an invisible outcome. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, uh, exactly. That's much more interesting also yeah. in terms of how to study this. this uh, right, uh, right. With, with also another question would be with uh, what disciplines to mm. study the work of Denise Scott Brown, because mm. uh, I probably I wouldn't be able mm. as an historian to study some processes yeah. in, of, in Philadelphia, yeah. because of course you have to deal with uh, mm. law, you have to deal mm. with uh, sociology yeah. and many more yeah. aspects that of course uh, yeah. are yeah. of course beyond mm. uh, the, the traditional uh, or, or outdated way of. Uh, being mm. an historian, an architecture mm. historian. Mm, so exactly. that, that's amazing. Yeah. That's, uh, that's no, this is a, this is another challenge, of course. I mean, I am an architect and architecture historian. I am not an urban planner. I'm 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 not a sociologist. I, I am not all of these things that Denise um, are so um, no um, knowledgeable. She in, in these uh, fields. She had you know she had this education mm -hmm. on three continents, uh, starting in Africa, then in, continuing in London, uh, and then in Philadelphia, and in all these different fields. And it's just amazing. And, and it's really it's really something to try to digest that and um, that is also why it was so helpful to have people helping me doing that <laughs> myself I, I wouldn't have uh, ventured on doing that actually so this product was really large enough <laughs> and and almost overwhelming enough and I'm, I'm very very happy it uh, turned out well and 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 all of that but um, and it's, it's joint yeah. creativity it is well. joint creativity so joint exactly creativity exactly and exactly the, the best so starting think, point so yeah so, so the form of it I think is also very fitting in a way to, to have this plurality of voices 
um, also. Yeah. Somehow I love this size, the size of the book, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but somehow it is misleading because mm. uh, it's much more than, than mm. this size. Right, uh, right. It opens uh, many more doors uh, yeah. and uh, potential. Uh, it's kind of this really condensed uh, yes. um, so, format. Well, it's a starting yeah. point. And, uh, You're definitely right. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Um, there are, are parts that she would, or aspects of her work that she would like to, to be seen as her legacy. And then there is her legacy as it is perceived. So, and then these are, are different things. I mean, I think, I think she is important, from, from my perspective, she's important on many, there are many, many, many interesting aspects of her, of her legacy, of, of the reception of, of her work. One thing is, of course, her work with Venturi. This is important in itself. It was a very long uh, collaboration. There are built projects and there are written um, books and so on. And this is really something. This is a part of architecture history and it's just nothing we, something we, we, we won't, we, we, we don't have to discuss it. It's, it's there. <laughs> then we have, if we, we zoom into, if we try to separate them and say, okay, so, so what is Denise? Um, and this is also a little bit of what we're trying to, to do in the book. What is Denise? Uh, then we have the social aspects, of course, and we have the, just, just open the eyes for the everyday and, and just don't erase it. <laughs> don't say it's too messy, it's too complicated, um, it's ugly, we don't understand it. We should just replace it with some beautiful high rises. <laughs> Right? So uh, she's saying, no, look again, um, please uh, give it another chance and really study it and, and uh, uh, make the, the best out of what we have, really. So, so this is, uh, Main Street is almost all right. It's so relevant, yes. And this was so provocative in the 60s. It was just, oh, how, how, can, I, how can someone say this? And it, it was, okay, so this is a, a quote from Complex and Contradiction Architecture, but this is really in this environment in Philadelphia at the time. This is what, what they discussed, what Venturi discussed with Scott Brown, uh, what the Scott Brown discussed with David Crane, uh, with Paul Davidoff, uh, with Herbert Gans, and so on and so forth. It was really this, uh, these ideas um, that, that she is building on. And um, so this, this is really important. And I think for, for me, this, this, we have so much to learn from this still. And, and this is a, a part of her, her legacy, which has been misunderstood and, and simplified to say that it's all about advertisement, it's all about uh, neon signs. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, this is maybe the most attractive or, or media you know, part is interesting to, to look at because the, the images are nice or whatever. But these, these other projects for small cities are much less sexy in a way, but, but they are so important. So it's really something we can learn from. Yeah. American culture because yeah. it could have changed completely Definitely. the way American yeah. cities. Yeah. Like, totally. Today, yeah. You know? So like she the yeah. and the social problems that yeah. have today. Yeah, yeah. So she, yes. So she as an architect and architect and planner is continuing uh, in the line of Jane Jacobs, really. So yeah. so this is what, what's going on there. So, so this is important. And the third aspect is uh, Denise Scott Brown as if the most iconic female architect um, and, and planner, I would say. So, so uh, the, her, her text, for instance, Room at the Top, Sex and the Star System, is really one of the most uh, important texts on um, the discrimination that women have faced for so long in the architecture uh, field. So this is also really something. And she is really a big, big inspiration uh, to so many still today. And it also sheds new uh, light somehow on postmodern American postmodern architecture. This is also an general. aspect, yes. So again, mm -hmm. from a superficial view of yeah. postmodern uh, American architecture. Yeah, definitely. Exactly. So this is also, I mean, something that we, we are trying to do. The reception of postmodernism has also been very superficial and the reception of their ideas. It is so much more to it, really. And, and the whole um, social reason for uh, looking at uh, 
statement that you were quoting, uh, I have it here, it's uh, ultima ultimately then it was not about jumping from architecture to planning, but about rethinking what it was to be an architect. Mm -hmm. And that choosing amelioration over revolution would itself be revolutionary in architecture. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's 2018, so that was from the uh, Sohn Meadow lecture, so yeah. probably it's one, one of the statements she would Give us a legacy. Yeah, exactly. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Yeah? Grazie. Yeah. Thank you. Bravo. Thank you. Bravo.